My name is Judy Chen. I'm one of the newer ophthalmologists working at the UWI clinic. And um, I'd like to thank Nancy and the colleagues for putting together the uh, Moving Forward event and for inviting me um, to join you tonight. So uh, I'd like to share with you some of my experiences with uh, uh, ocular conditions associated with uh, uh, Parkinson's disease. And uh, so you all know that Parkinson's disease is a type of neurodegenerative disease that affects patients' uh, mo mobility and cognition. And uh, patients with Parkinson's, we have lots of uh, ocular problems too. And some of these are more specific for Parkinson's and some of them are not. They're, they can happen among general population. So, um, but what we need to know here is uh, uh, what kind of a condition that you may have and uh, what options are out there. So, uh, knowing that a better understanding can reduce, help reduce anxieties and the frustration. And uh, I'm going to try my best to keep you all awake, but uh, if you have any questions, just interrupt me in the middle of the talk. I have no financial interest to disclose. So uh, in today's talk, we're going to talk about what ocular symptoms would you experience in Parkinson's and why would you develop these symptoms and uh, how are these symptoms treated. So ocular symptoms are quite common in Parkinson's and uh, many of you have probably already experienced a bunch of them. So blurriness, surface irritation, double vision, light sensitivity, and hallucinations. And uh, so these symptoms can accumulate to the point that interrupt, that interfere with your daily activities. Drivings, readings, so those are big. And uh, sometimes it can get to the point that you feel like you can't function. And, uh, but things can get even worse because when you go to see your eye doctor because you can't see well, they may tell you, while well, you have a normal eye examination, looks like uh, you don't have much of uh, things in the eye that we can see. So a number of changes can happen uh, along with uh, the progression of Parkinson's. And uh, they can happen in both in the eye and in the brain or the connection between the eye and the brain. So, um, so together they can, they can cause, really cause problem in your vision, your ability to see. So uh, this includes decreased contrast sensitivity, decreased color discrimination, uh, retinal dopamine deficiency that goes along with a general overall reduction of dopamine production, and, uh, and also visual spatial deficit, which is a problem that has something to do with the brain and eye connection. So we're going to talk a little more about contrast sensitivity because that's important for your ability to drive. So contrast sensitivity is important feature of uh, our visual function, although unfortunately we don't normally test it. So uh, you probably never heard somebody tell you that you have decreased the contrast sensitivity. And uh, so the contrast sen sensitivity measures our ability to differentiate objects from their background. So this is critical in situations such as low light, fog, or glare, when naturally the contrast between the object and uh, the background is often reduced. So one big example is driving at night. So uh, driving at night really requires good contrast sensitivity and in order to drive safely. So this is the contrast sensitivity chart and you probably never seen this before because this is normally used in a very specific situation. We don't normally test it in the eye clinic. So on the top over here is the letter that has high contrast. So they look more black. They're easily stand out from the background. And uh, here's the high contrast. And uh, the, bottom, the bottom right here, over here, it's very hard to see, right, the letters, because they look gray. They don't stand out that easily from the background. So these are the letters that has low contrast. So in the uh, eye clinic, remember those uh, letter charts? Those are the letters used to test high, uh, high contrast. And the, those are testing how small you are able to see the letter. 
but there are very high contrast. So you may be able to see a very small letter, and your vision might be 2020, but you still have difficulty driving at night because you couldn't see, you couldn't tell there's a car coming at you. That's because you have normal high contrast sensitivity, but you don't have a normal contrast low sensitivity, low contrast sensitivity. That's more important than the lighter vision for your driving. So uh, impaired ocular motility is also very common in uh, Parkinson's patients. And this goes along with uh, our generally de decreased motility in our body. So now among various of ocular motility uh, function, the saccade, saccade is one of the more important specific uh, aspect of the ocular motility for Parkinson's. For saccade, it's a type of a rapid eye movement that allows, uh, our, allows us to shift, do a quick shift from objects to the, to the other. So uh, we need to do this rapidly and precisely, but Parkinson's patients, we normally have a slower and imprecise saccade, so the problem will be it's hard for you to scan in the environment scanning objects from here to there. And when you read, you find it hard to scan words on the book. And in addition to decreased saccade, uh, patients with Parkinson's can also have difficulty keeping their eyes still when you try to fix it on an object. So that puts another challenge to your ability to look at things clearly. So um, now ocular surface irritation tear film dysfunction. This is probably one, one of the common ocular complaints in Parkinson's disease. And uh, so now here's the picture. This is a very common type of picture that we see in clinics. And uh, you can tell that the eyes are very angry. It looks red and uh, it looks crusty. So uh, here are the, the eye symptoms you may experience when you have a, a suboptimal tear film production. So light sensitivity, tearing, crusting at the eyelash, eye stuck in the morning, and uh, dry eye, burning, gritty or sandy sensation, red eye, and sometimes you, you can have eye pain too. And uh, so remember that many Parkinson's medication, when you have a severe dry eye, you need to look at your medication list because a bunch of them can reduce the tear production. And uh, so those are our time. Uh, um, cogentin, arcanitin, norflex, uh, camadrin, uh, aripiclin, and uh, sumatrol. And uh, they, they reduce the production of tear film. They, also, they can also make your vision blurry through another separate mechanism. So um, make sure that to look through your medication, and especially if there's a recently uh, added medication like this, so my and gland dysfunction is another big contributor to tear film dysfunction. So my and gland over here is this little tiny oil gland that lines up the upper and the lower eyelid, just like a oil pipes. There are about 50 of them in the upper eyelid and about 25 of them in the lower eyelid. So they produce oil that coats the surface of the eye. This oil can uh, keep the eye, t keep the tear, liquid tear, tears from evaporating. So it's very important to, in the maintenance of the tear film. So when you have a mybalmin gland dysfunction, and uh, you can have, a, you can have all kinds of eye changes. And uh, so uh, can you see it clearly, the, uh, the picture? So the top picture over here shows the hardening of the uh, oil gland. So as a result, they are uh, clogged up of the opening of the uh, uh, oil gland. And th this picture over here shows some infection. And after that clogged up of uh, uh, tear film, uh, oil gland, and then there's the inflammation of the eyelid. And uh, so in chronic uh, stage of inflammation, the eye, there, you may have skin changes, you may have crusty stuff. And uh, when chronic inflammation gets pretty severe, you have uh, some scarring of the, the eyelid, and then the eyelash, they fall off, and uh, they can also grow inward, so that can irritate your eye surface even more. So treating 
uh, meibomian gland dysfunction or tear film dysfunction doesn't require fancy technologies. You can do it. It's affordable. It's a home therapy. All it takes is your hard work on your part. So basically, this is what we call home hygiene, late hygiene treatment. And many of you is, is, are probably uh, familiar with um, this therapy. So it consists of a warm compression, five minutes, followed by a lead scrub for uh, a few minutes. After that, put in the artificial tears. If you don't do the first and second step, just put in the artificial tears, it's not going to work. It's just waste, waste your money. And uh, so a warm compression, you use a heating pad or uh, just a warm uh, washcloth. Just put it over your eyelid for five minutes. That can help soften the uh, oil duct. And after that, you use a wash towel to just soak with a baby shampoo. And then close your eyes and scrub the, uh, the, the margin of the eyelid. Get rid of the, uh, um, the, that little um, hardening at the opening. And then that will open up the, uh, the uh, oil duct and then so the oil can come out freely. So after that, you do artificial tears. And many patients, they just do this twice a day and put it incorporate into their daily bathroom routines and they like it. Once you enjoy the results, you're not going to forget doing it. All right, any questions so far? Can you all hear me? Okay, good. If Nancy. If experiencing that problem, would that be an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor appointment, or would they just see their usual doctor? Well, usually you start out with eye doctor if you're not sure, if you have significant eye symptoms. And, uh, but if you're familiar, you've already seen the eye doctor, and uh, you're already told that, that this is the problem, you can just work hard at home with this late hygiene. It can actually sometimes really clear up your vision too. And all right, so we're going to switch gear to talk about double vision. Just to make sure I make myself clear, I'm going to have a little quiz, so you really need to listen <coughs> carefully. So double vision. So uh, first question, how many of you have ever experienced a double vision? Not many, actually less than I uh, expected. So double vision is very common in Parkinson's and also among general population too. So it, it sounds pretty uh, straightforward, double vision, what double vision is. Seen double, seen to image, right? But uh, double vision can be more complicated than that because the cause of the double vision can be many things. And some of them are more serious, um, such as uh, stroke, brain stroke, or brain tumor. Some of the causes can be as simple as uh, dry eyes or inappropriate eyeglasses prescription. So when you see double, the most important thing for yourself, for you, is to figure out whether you have monocular or binocular double vision. Now this is what we need to um, catch really carefully, because you need to do this for yourself this is important and convenient if you know how to do it. So here's what you want to do. When you have double vision, you cover one eye or the other, and then you should be able to tell if double vision goes away when you cover one eye or the other. It doesn't matter which eye you cover. So you cover your left eye, you still see double. You cover your right eye, right eye you still see double. That's monocular double vision. That means the double vision, you see double when you're only uh, looking at things out of one eye. So if you cover one eye or the other, it doesn't matter which one you cover, double goes away, that's binocular double vision. That means you have to look at things with both your eyes open in order to see double. So is that a pretty clear definition? Okay, so now I'm going to ask, for those who have ever seen double, do you have, who are, how many of you who have monocular double vision. I only see one. So I would assume the rest of you, the, you will have a binocular double vision then? Is that the case? Okay. All right. So now there are some other tips to help you differentiate between monocular double vision and the binocular double vision. So mono, in monocular double vision, this is how it looks like. So the two image, one of them looks like a ghost image and or shadow 
overlapping with the real image. So uh, here is the shadow. And uh, many times it can be blinked away. So you blink, you try to focus, refocus, the double goes away. So that's monocular double vision. So monocular double vision is usually related to the eye surface problem. So dry eye, blepharitis, so meibomian gland dysfunction, the tear film becomes irregular. And uh, or it could be eyeglasses issue, inappropriate eyeglasses prescription, or it could be cataract. So, but none of those causes for monocular double vision is either life-threatening or vision-threatening. Yes, you, we need to take care of it. We can do at home uh, lead hygiene therapy for dry eyes, blepharitis. We can go to the optical shop to get a glasses to get rid of double. We, we, see, we, need to, we may need to see an eye doctor for a cataract surgery, but none of them will cause your permanent vision loss. So um, this is monocular double vision. So in um, contrast, the binocular double vision, the cause, whatever caused the binocular double vision is more serious. And it's usually uh, related to a neurological uh, disease. So binocular double vision, when, when you see a binocular double vision, the two images are equal, equally uh, clear. So it's real two images. And uh, the image can be up and down, can be side by side, or it can be crooked, so diagonal double vision. So the cause of the binocular double vision is because due to the misalignment between the two eyes. So it can happen with uh, uh, damage of the nerve, with the damage in the brain. So it could be anywhere from brain tumor stroke, aneurysm, or uh, some other neurological diseases, myasthenia gravis, or a stroke to the, uh, to the nerve that controls the muscle, or it could be eye muscle problems, sometimes from inflammations, from a tumor infiltration. The bottom line, the binocular double vision is way more serious, and then you need to see an eye doctor for further evaluation. Any questions? Yes. Yes, so a grave disease is. So uh, your question is, is grave disease causing the binocular double vision? The answer is yes. So we all know, so do we all know what grave di grave disease is? Right, it is, uh, Graves' disease is a type of a thyroiditis, so inflammation of the thyroid. And uh, in a small proportion of patients with a thyroiditis, inflammation of the thyroid, somehow this inflammation also attacks the eye. So that's Graves' eye disease. So when people have a Graves' eye disease, the, uh, there are a huge amount of the inflammation of the eyelid, of the soft tissue behind the eyeball, of the eye muscles itself. That's why uh, people may have double vision. But uh, when, when you have a Graves' eye disease, you can have all kinds of ocular problems, not only the double vision. And does that answer your question? Yeah. So bottom line, again, when you have binocular double vision, go see eye doctor, because you need to be further evaluated. So uh, among various cause of uh, binocular double vision, convergence insufficiency is one of them. It's very common. It's very common for both Parkinson's disease patients and for general population. So we're going to just talk about convergence insufficiency um, a little more because it's important for your reading and which is what many Parkinson's patients find difficult, difficult with. So convergence insufficiency is defined as dissociation between the two images. When you look at near, two images are always side by side. It's always at near. So it's more prominent when you read. That's how you find it. And when you drive, when you watch TV, no problem at all. So uh, in, in addition to double vision, patients may have eye strain symptoms, usually brought up by prolonged near task. And uh, so you may have eye strain, eye pain, discomfort, and sometimes headache. And, but in convergence insufficiency, you shouldn't have any other neurological deficits. So no other stroke-like symptoms. If you do, that's not convergence insufficiency. So here's what convergence entails. So 
Now, convergence is the process of the eyes. Eyes are turning in when we look up close. So um, here is Carol. Carol is standing at distance. When we look at Carol, when you look at Carol, the two eyes are slightly apart. Now, Lee, she's standing right in front of you. So when we look at Lee, our eyes go in towards each other. That's convergence. And so in patients with a convergence insufficiency, our eyes are not coming in sufficiently when you look up close. That's why there's a separation of the two image. So that's what causes the double vision at near. So the uh, convergence insufficiency, you need to see an eye doctor. And uh, there are a couple of things that we need to pay attention to. So with convergence insufficiency, a lot of times uh, you will hear that your doctor says, we would be better to, to get rid of those fancy bifocals and uh, progressives, and then just use the single vision lens that can help with your gaining your convergence power. And we'll talk about that. And the exercise, many patients ask me whether they can exercise of their eye muscles. The answer is no, unfortunately. The exercise wouldn't work at this age. And the prism is the treatment for convergence insufficiency. So here, uh, is, so the prism is an optical device that helps to uh, bring your, the two images together, basically an optical illusion. And uh, so there are two types of prism glasses. Now this one is what we call for now prism. This is just looking like this. You may not be able to see it because of the background. It's a plastic film with lines on it. We stick it onto the uh, eyeglasses over here. And uh, so this is a temporary one and you can take it off, put it back on and it's low cost. We, al we always do the temporary, glass, uh, the temporary one first. And uh, sometimes people go to an optical shop and then they put the permanent one immediately. That's a lot of times so that wouldn't work. You just waste your money. And because the things might change over time and then once you put in the permanent one, and then and there's no way you can change it. So um, here's the ground in prism. This is the permanent prism. And uh, so this one, there's no films because the film is already built into your eyeglasses. So a lot of times you couldn't see anything if you just look at the glasses. If you look at the side, do you see there's a uh, um, plane over there? It looks like a triangle. That's how the prism glasses look like. And this is more exaggerated. This is a huge amount of prism put in. Normally it's just looking like this, just like a regular eyeglasses. But usually we, we allow at least three to six months and we give you the temporary, the prism, for you to try and until you feel for sure, yeah, this is the number I need. I like this number before we actually give you a prescription for the permanent, uh, permanent prism because the cost is higher. Now, here is Mrs. Clinton. Looks like she's wearing a, uh, for now, prism on the left lens. It's vertical line, so that means she may have convergence insufficiency, actually, because that's correction of uh, horizontal double vision. And uh, so now that's double vision. Any questions? All right, we're doing well. And uh, everybody is awake, at least, looks like. And uh, so abnormal eyelid movements is pretty common, too, in Parkinson's. So there are different forms. There's reduced spontaneous blink. And uh, uh, if the blink is reduced, then that can damage the uh, tear film integrity. And the blepharospasm is a type of uncontrolled spasm of the eyelid. So you just can't open your eyes. And apraxia of lid opening. So it's difficulty initiating eye opening. Your eyes are stick together. It takes some time and effort for you to open your eyes. And uh, so blepharospasm is a type of involuntary closure, eyelid closure. And uh, just look like this. This gentleman over here, he's, he's frowning, not because it's painful, because blepharospasm is not supposed to be painful. It's painless. And, uh, but it's very uncomfortable. And uh, so now the treatment of the blepharospasm because it can be triggered by dry eye, by uh, ocular surface irritation. So taking care of ocular surface is actually sometimes can solve the problem. So again, home lead hygiene treatment. And uh, if 
your, you still couldn't open your eyes. You still squeeze your eyes closed. Then the next step would be for you to see uh, eye, an eye doctor so you can get a Botox treatment. And uh, so that's a pretty effective and uh, um, safe procedure to get rid of the blepharospasm. So I was wondering how many of you have ever had an eyelid opening problem? So it's not common, I guess. Yeah. Have you, have you get Botox or? No. So how was that treated? It hasn't been treated. So is that pretty common? Is that pretty frequent? Do you have it every day? Almost every day. You may want to talk to your eye doctor if it gets to the point that it gets so annoying, probably. Um, so now I wanted to mention just the eye glasses issue. It sounds like it's just a minor issue and it's not as fancy as a surgery or implants, but uh, it's very annoying if this is not the right, you're not doing it right. So the, now, long story short, Parkinson's patients should avoid bifocals and progressive glasses because you have impaired eye movement and because you, you may have convergence insufficiency, at least weak convergence. So uh, now here, Now, normally, we have uh, one pair of glasses, and uh, the whole lens only gives us a focus on one plane. So whether it's distance or whether it's reading glasses, that's the best setting for Parkinson's patients. Now, uh, the bifocals is built by putting the distance and the near lens into one piece, of, one piece of glasses, so you don't have to switch between the two pairs of glasses. So uh, now progressive glasses, the fancy type of eyeglasses is even more tricky because the progressive glasses, they are supposed to put all different kinds of uh, plane of focus all together into one piece of glasses. So you're supposed to be able to look at variety of distances without having to switch eyeglasses. But a lot of times, really a lot of times, Parkinson's patients, they're not uh, enjoy the uh, progressive glasses and uh, it's, they're only suffering. That's, that's uh, my experience. Well, let's actually ask, how many of you are actually wearing the progressive eyeglasses? Okay. So now, I'd be interested, actually, what would be your experience? Are you doing pretty well with the progressive glasses? Are progressive glasses the same as no-line bifocal? No, it's not the no-line. No-line bifocal is still bifocal. You have two pieces of lens. So one, the upper part is for distance, and lower part is for, for near. The progressives, they have uh, many lines. Of they, they have increasing, they have a gradient of increasing power. So you can look at near, up close. You can look at computer 10 yards away, 20 yards away, and uh, up to infinity. You don't have to switch eyeglasses. So I have found that Parkinson's patients, they're not doing well with the progressive glasses. And usually they spend um, over a thousand dollars for a pair of glasses, but and then at the end they have to go back to their single, uh, single vision reader especially for somebody who likes, who enjoy reading for a prolonged time, and a, a single vision glasses would be a better choice. Now, here are some tips for reading. So basically, if you're reading for a long time, single vision glasses would be the best choice for you. It can reduce, it can give you the minimum amount of eye strain. And uh, you, for those who have a uh, tremor, you want to use musical or uh, cookbook stand to place the book. And uh, of course, we need to allow sufficient light because of reduced contrast sensitivity in Parkinson's disease. And then you, some of the patients, you, all, you also find difficulty just keeping your eyes in the line because of your eye movement problem. So in that case, you use your finger or, or a ruler to draw eyes across the page in order to keep up, the, to find the, uh, the, the line. Now, cataract. Cataract is an age-related ocular disease. 
that is not that is not specific for Parkinson's. So cataract is just like a, a gray hair. We all have it when we get to a certain stage of our life. And uh, so in cataract, so basically it, it's a yellowing or opacification of uh, the crystal lens over here. This is the front part of the eye. This is the back part of the eye. So uh, when it gets to the certain stage, it can impair the ability to see, so it needs to be taken care of. Let's see, how many of you have ever had a cataract surgery? Not many. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised because about one third or a quarter in this room have had a cataract surgery. And um, so when you have a cataract surgery, here's what surgeon does. So they take out the, uh, uh, the yellowing crystal lens from here, take it out, and then they put in a, a piece of a transparent artificial lens back into the uh, uh, lens socket so we're able to, to see well. So the cataract surgery is actually a very small, small minor procedure that is performed uh, by almost all the general eye surgeons. So it's safe and uh, usually it's associated with a very good outcome. Patients are always very happy. And uh, so this is about the cataract surgery. So what complicates the matter is the selection of intraocular lens. So there are two major types of intraocular lens. The one is monofocal intraocular lens. The other one is called premium, so multifocal intraocular lens. So uh, on the left side, this is monofocal. On the right side is the multifocal, the premium lens. So let me, let me ask, so among those who had a cataract surgery, how many of you had a, a premium or multifocal intraocular lens? Just one? Okay, so that's good. Now, sir, would you tell us your experience with uh, the multifocal? Well, I'm not having to screen the whole thing like that. I had a two operations on my eye, and so I got that double vision. Yeah, so did you have a multifocal intraocular lens in one eye or both? No, I had one eye done, and I did the both eyes. You did the multifocal in one eye? Yeah. Okay. Now, why did you have two operations then? Oh, okay, I see, I see. Right, right, right. So I have, new, I have had numerous patients, not only Parkinson's patient, but uh, also the other uh, patients. And then they just came over here. They're really miserable from uh, multifocal intraocular lens, not mentioning that multifocal, the premium lens, actually um, needs you to pay out of pocket almost $3,000 a piece because it's not covered by insurance company. And uh, so here's how the two lens works. It's not the, uh, the fault of uh, the uh, multifocal intraocular, uh, intraocular lens itself. It is who is the best candidate for the uh, uh, fancy lens. And uh, so for monofocal intraocular lens, it's just one piece. Just think about this as eyeglasses. So monofocal intraocular lens is like a single, re single vision eyeglasses. Just one piece of glasses only give you focus for one plane. So usually it's adjusted for your distance vision. Now uh, after the surgery, you may able to see distance pretty clearly, but you still need to uh, wear reading glasses for near. So that's multifocal intraocular lens. Now uh, that's monofocal intraocular lens. So multifocal intraocular lens, are you able to see, are we able to see there are multiple concentric circles on the lens. Can we turn off the light? Because I really want to make, make sure that everybody gets this part. All right, now it's a, it's a lot better. Thanks. So are we able to see the difference? This is one piece, monofocal. This is the fancy multifocal. Do you see the concentric rings over there? So just think that the multifocal lens, the fancy lens, is equivalent to progressive eyeglasses. It works the same way. So basically, they put different pieces of a lens together, supposed to provide multiple uh, plane of focus for multiple planes. So, so that patient don't have to wear eyeglasses. 
And then without wearing reading glasses, you can see both distance and near and the distances in between. So that's the beauty of a multifocal intraocular lens. But unfortunately, it's very um, demanding in terms of uh, who gets it, who can enjoy it. Now, if you think yourself, it's like her, you might be a good candidate. You're healthy, you're very uh, mobile, you're very active physically, and uh, you're playing tennis, you're hiking, you're rock climbing perhaps. And uh, so if you're participating in a lot of sports activities, you might be a good candidate for uh, multifocal intraocular lens. So in order to be a good candidate, you need a normal ocular motility, you need a normal pupil motility, and uh, you also, you couldn't have any dry eyes. And then you should be able to adjust and adapt to your new vision because it requires some time to adjust. And uh, so basically, why the, uh, the people with, uh, some people suffering from uh, multifocal intraocular lens is because yes, they have option of uh, multiple planes, they have option of uh, seeing multiple focus through that intraocular lens. But the problem is they couldn't find it. They couldn't find the, uh, the right place on the lens to look at the right distance. So basically, you're not using the right lens power. And uh, if you couldn't find the right place, and then you're only seeing all the blurriness. And this is what my patients usually experience. So um, with that amount of money, and then you're not, you're suffering. Some patients may even say that they they just back the surgeon to take it out. Some people, they do take it out and they put the uh, monofocal, so the, the standard lens back. So it could be as bad as that. Because many of you may have cataract surgery. I want you to really remember this part. If you have questions, just ask me because when I see those patients, it's really hard because they've already had a fancy lens placed. It's very hard to justify to take it out because surgery went perfect. The lens looks in the right place, it looks clean. It just doesn't work, so it's unfortunate. Yes? Uh, this person is coming for cataract using. Is that why they show up in your office? No, so many times, because I'm not a surgeon, they show up in my office is because they can't function after cataract surgery. So their surgeon sent them over and uh, just to trying to figure out why because the surgery looks, it, it went pretty well because if we look into the, the, uh, the machine, the lens looks perfect, it's clean. There's no signs of inflammation or any trauma in the eye. The procedure went well, but the problem is the, uh, the patients couldn't enjoy the lens. They couldn't utilize the lens. That's why the, uh, the patient comes to us. Yes? Yeah, so that's a good question. The question is, are if the patients are advised by the surgeon which type of lens? Yes, the surgeons are always do. There are variabilities, so individual difference among surgeons. Some of the surgeons, they're more careful. Some of the surgeons, because of course they want the mother focal lens, it's fancy, and if it works, it's beautiful. And it's also high, um, high, high cost. And uh, so, yeah, it's hard to say, but yes, generally the surgeon is going to advise you on which kind of intraocular lens, but all these patients are advised beforehand, so there's really not a best way to tell which patient is going to suffer and which is going to benefit. So those who are benefit, they're really happy about their lens because they can really go back to their normal life. Yeah, many people, they like, they, they said, because the, the story is very appealing, and uh, you go back to your normal life, and some people, they like to do different things, for example. And uh, so there really is, um, I'd say, I don't think it's, it's, it's anybody's mistake. It's just the experience, and the experience with the general population, and the experience with the Parkinson's um, population in, in uh, particular. So... Um, but just to make sure that uh, as a uh, neuro-ophthalmologist, we always advise patients 
especially patients with, because I have lots of patients with brain tumor, MS, brain trauma. So those are the patients, they may share many of the features, ocular features that you have. So ocular motility, dry eyes, and uh, double vision, and all sorts of things. So I always advise them, it wouldn't be a good idea. You might have a problem with uh, uh, the fancy lens because of your other vision problems. So just to be really careful, you're going to make your decision, for, you, for yourself, you got to be careful. Now, lastly, I, I like to talk about a little about sleep in Parkinson's because this is a, a very important area for Parkinson's patients, and this is all, all, also the, uh, my, my research interest. So let me ask you, how many of you say you have perfect sleep? You're completely happy with your sleep. None. How many of you have ever, you would say, well, I, I'm not happy with my sleep. I wish I can improve my sleep. So how about the rest? Sucks. Okay. Yeah, so sleep disruption is very common in the uh, general population, general elderly, and uh, it's more prevalent in uh, patients with Parkinson's. And you may ask, so how does that sleep have anything to do with, with our eyes? We, we don't accept our, we close our eyes when we sleep. So it's actually very relevant. Now, have you uh, all, are you all aware that this year's Nobel Prize for Medicine goes in the circadian scientist? Three circadian scientists, American. So this is just relevant to that. So circadian rhythm is a type of uh, physical activities. It's a collection of uh, physical activities, vital phys physical activities that is supposed to synchronize the majority of our physiologic and the biologic activities to the external light-dark cycle. So such as sleep is one of them, the others are hormonal secretion, body temperature. So we all know without uh, industrial light in the old ages, we know when to go to sleep, we know when to wake up, and uh, our, our activities are perfectly aligned with uh, the external light, right? That's what circadian system does. So circadian system is connected between the eye and the brain. So the connection between the eye and the brain makes up the circadian system. So here's, now when we talk about the eye, we always think about vision. So the, the ability to, to look at the external objects and then transmit it to the back, back part of the brain, that's the vision center. So this is taking care of the perception of the objects. So this is the vision. So circadian rhythm is the non-visual aspect of the eye, which is equally important, but far less appreciated uh, functionality of the eye. So among all these small brain areas, all of these are connected to the eye. This is the important uh, biological clock. So this is in the hypothalamus. This is the sleep regulation center. So basically the external light is transmitted through a specific path in the eye to the brain sleep center. So regulate our sleep. That's why when we have age-related ocular disease, we lose our sleep. So have you heard, heard about that? Blinded people, they lose sleep. They sleep during the daytime. They don't sleep through, uh, throughout night. That's because we lose, that in the, uh, we lose that connection between the eye and the brain. So here's what I do. So study how the eyes works with the brain to impact the sleep and the cognition eventually. So uh, the two main questions is the eyes role in sleep and the cognition. And eventually, ultimately, our goal is to develop potential intervention using light therapy to promote sleep in Parkinson's in, and in elderly in general. So stay tuned. I think we're going to hopefully to develop to that stage in a few years. All right, here's take home points. So number one, in patients, among patients with uh, Parkinson's disease, aggressive home lead hygiene therapy can help alleviate dry eye and the blepharitis. Number two, avoid bifocal and progressive glasses. Using stay with a uh, single vision glasses and for distance and near task. And uh, number three, avoid multifocal or be very careful about multifocal intraocular lens. 
upon the time of cataract surgery. And number four, now Parkinson's disease patients, even if you have normal eye examination, you have vision of 2020, you can, have, you can still have significant uh, functional impairment, such as driving at night. And uh, so, yes, so it can be explained. And uh, even though you have normal, normal, eye exam uh, normal eye examination. All right, thank you very much for your attention.